Good evening, my name is Sue and I work with the Youth and Community Development Team at Northern Beaches Council. Welcome to our fourth webinar in the Safe and Sound Wellbeing series. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge all of those with a personal experience of suicide or mental ill health, as well as families, friends, carers and support services who help us all to live well. And tonight I'd like to acknowledge any LGBTI QA plus people in our audience, their friends, families and allies. You're all very welcome. The Safe and Sound webinar series features six free wellbeing webinars aimed at young people, those who support young people, men, women, LGBTI, QA plus communities and seniors. In each webinar, you will hear from a range of local experts sharing information on key stresses, how to support others and how to access local support services. So whether it's to help you or those around you, we hope everyone attending this webinar tonight or watching it on demand in the future will get something positive out of coming along. These webinars have been made possible thanks to grant funding from the New South Wales Ministry of Health. Today's webinar is Let's Talk Living Well for LGBTIQA plus communities. And we have four great speakers lined up for you. We have Claire from 2010, Marie from PFLAG, Hilary from Inner City Legal, and Siobhan from ACON. They're all joining us from their homes and services. However, Mike and I are lucky enough to sit together at Glen Street Theatre, albeit at a very safe physical distance. So we wanted to host this specific webinar in recognition of our LGBTIQA+, or rainbow communities here on the Northern Beaches. Now I'd like to introduce you to Mike Burns, who will be moderating all of our webinars. Mike is a psychotherapist and a trainer with Lifeline Northern Beaches. Over to you, Mike. Thank you, Sue. Good to be here with you. So a few bits of housekeeping before we start. So if, if you haven't watched a webinar using Zoom before, Please note your camera and microphone are automatically disabled. There will be no slides as this is a conversation style webinar. You'll only be able to see one presenter at a time who is currently speaking. So the webinar will be recorded and available on the Northern Beaches Council website over the next week or two. You'll hear from each presenter for around 10 minutes each and at the end of the webinar we'll have time for a question and answer session. You can submit your questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen on your toolbar. You can do this anonymously if you wish. And we realise that sometimes when speaking about mental health, the people with lived experience of this or who are currently feeling vulnerable may find themselves impacted by the material. If this is the case for you, we recommend that you reach out and get support with a friend or family member or to an organisation such as those we'll hear from tonight who are in a position to hear and support you, including organisations such as Lifeline. We encourage you to connect and get support if you need to. And this is something that we've really pushed as a theme throughout these webinars, haven't we, Sue? The idea Absolutely. that reaching out is a strength and getting support is essential to health and wellbeing. That's a very common theme that runs through all of the webinars, indeed. Mm -hmm. um, so to get started, uh, we have four great panellists ready for you tonight. Um, I'd like to firstly introduce Claire from 2010. Welcome, Claire. And I wondered firstly if you could give us a bit of an overview of 2010 and what it is, what it is that you do. Hi. Um, hi, Sue. Hi, Mike. Hi. And hi to all the other panellists. Thanks so much for having me as part of the panel. So um, I'm meeting you all here today from um, Gadigal land. I'm actually in the 2010 office. And I just want to start by also kind of acknowledging and paying my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, so I also, I guess, want to do a shout out to any um, brother, boy, sister, girls or other gender diverse Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And I'd like to continue my acknowledgements by um, doing a shout out to any LGBTIQA plus people um, in the audience tonight or those that um, those of our the people that have fought for struggles and community activism before us that have paved the way for the journeys that, and work that we're now on. Um, so I'd like to just kind of start with the, those set of acknowledgements and say hello um, and that I will be kind of guest speaking to you all tonight um, specifically to those in the audience who are um, LGBTQA plus who um, are the allies, family, friends and supports of, of those communities and, and I'm myself part of those communities as a queer person. 
So um, thanks so much for having me. Um, here I am at 2010, like I said. So this is the drop-in space, which is one of the spaces we have here in our Chippendale office. Um, and in this space, we do a whole bunch of social support things for young people and also adult groups. So it's open um, most afternoons of the week and people can access it. There's a kitchen just behind me. Um, there's couches and all sorts of fun things and activities, but also a place to connect to case, case managers or um, our counsellor here um, and other types of support that um, 2010 can offer to young people. And kind of to my right, um, off screen and through a wall is our um, QLife offices, which is the, um, the telephone offices for the QLife um, crew who are um, here in New South Wales um, every day of the year. Um, on web chat and telephone lines. Um, it's a peer support service that people can access. Um, you can see the number on the screen kind of through tonight's webinar when you see Sue and Mike's face, it'll come up. Um, and so um, QLife is a national service and 2010 is, I guess, the state partner of that service. So, um, and that's a service that's been running actually in lots of different ways since 1973 when it was part of an organisation called Camp New South Wales and Phone a Friend. So I guess I just want to acknowledge that really important history for this work, for this service 2010, but also all of our community services on the panel tonight. Um, and, you know, like the work that we do is really about making a message that um, all people um, of all genders and sexualities and bodies um, you know, we wish good health and good life and um, freedom from discrimination and oppression. And so that's the work that we do and we reach out to, I guess, our queer communities and LGBTQA plus communities to do that. So um, part of my job is to do learning and education and training work. And so often I kind of find myself in spaces where people are, you know, doing workshops and people are asking questions like LGBTQA plus, all these letters, things change all the time. I feel nervous. I don't want to offend anybody. Um, what all the letters mean? Um, tell me about this acronym and I guess I just want to point out at the very beginning of this webinar that um, the LGBTQA plus community is actually a whole set of communities and um, those communities speak to um, some of those letters I guess speak to um, relationships and sexuality some of them speak to our bodies and some of them speak to our gender identity and gender expression so it's many communities and many stories and experiences that are of course informed by all sorts of other intersections of our lives. Um, but I guess what brings us together in a movement, if you like, is a real willingness to, um, to support each other, to challenge um, discrimination and oppression where it shows up and to say that all of our bodies and all of our relationships have a place and should be celebrated and supported. So that's, I guess, what I want to kind of acknowledge at the beginning when we talk about LGBTQA plus communities. Um, and I guess I want to say that that plus, I guess, is an acknowledgement that um, our language is evolving all the time and, and growing and our communities are growing as we continue to talk and advocate and have greater representation and um, space to kind of share information and, and speak our stories. So um, it's a evolving and dynamic space, but I'm really um, proud to be a member of um, the LGBTQA plus community. Yeah, so that's, that's my answer. Thanks, Claire. That's a really great introduction to this webinar, I have to say. And clearly you offer some fantastic flex flexible offerings um, there. So awesome. I wondered, um, so um, you also received funding from the New South Wales Ministry of Health um, for suicide prevention gatekeeper training, like Northern Beaches Council. And we were fortunate enough to only be um, the two of the eight organisations across New South Wales that received this funding. Our funding is targeting young people, men, seniors and emergency services. Um, I wondered from your perspective from 2010, can you tell us why suicide is an important issue um, for the LGBTIQA plus community? Thanks so much, Sue. Yeah, it's a real, um, it's a real honor to, to do this work and to really do it in a very um, dedicated way. So this funding that we've, you know, the Northern Beaches Council and also 2010's received allows us to really focus on not only on suicide prevention, but also suicide intervention. And that's a specific skill set that is about, I guess, um, suicide first aid and supporting all of us to grow our confidence and our skills 
to understand and support our own communities. So we really see, I guess, this work as community work and um, collective responsibility to keep all of us, to care for us all and not, I guess, individual people's responsibility who are experiencing distress. And um, I guess that's a really, I feel really proud to be part of that work. And as a trainer in a particular model called ASSIST, um, hoping to share, share those skills with lots of folks through this time. Um, and yeah, I guess why that's important to LGBTQA plus communities, um, you know, like, like many communities, um, sometimes we can struggle with mental ill health and experiences of suicide or thoughts of suicide. And I guess I want to really acknowledge that um, it's not because someone is LGBTQA plus that they are um, more likely to, like it's not endemic that they would experience lots of suicide, but sometimes we find ourselves having additional barriers or challenges um, in our lives that can feel like stigma and can feel like extra work that LGBTQA plus folks sometimes experience. And that can lead to um, stigma or shame or um, uh, extra challenges. So for us as a community, it's really important for us to talk about um, those experiences of discrimination or um, feeling depressed or feeling isolated that can sometimes happen um, and to hold ourselves, to build our skills, to kind of talk, talk about that openly and um, without shame. Um, and, you know, um, to, I guess, build a, a, a more collaborative collective sense of taking care of ourselves. Um, some of those reasons why it's, I guess, important is that, you know, sometimes it can be, um, we might not have as many models of LGBTQA plus um, folk in our lives, in the media, in um, who are growing old. Um, there's, um, sometimes it can be difficult to access services that are inclusive or affirming or um, can, can hold the stories of our lives fully. Um, and, you know, I think that us doing this work for ourselves is a really important part of building the skill set um, to identify when people are struggling, um, listen for those invitations of where um, people are kind of wanting to talk about where they're at and finding ways to listen, hold those stories, but also um, support people to seek further help. So That's um, great. Really yeah. nice summary, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, so just to wrap up, I just kind of wondered um, what messages or words of support you might have for LGBTIQA plus uh, communities, you know, who, who might be participating tonight. What would you like them to know? I guess I'd like to say um, welcome. Hello. Thanks for being here. Um, please do reach out. That There are um, lots of, um, lots of su support and services available um, if you... Um, wish to connect with people and that those services can be from other LGBTIQA plus folk. Sometimes it can be difficult to, or it can be an extra barrier to not know how supportive someone will be when you um, go through the door. And so um, really do, I guess, reach out. And I guess I'd say to everybody that, um, you know, this is, we don't exist in a vacuum. So um, it's on all of us to make all of our work and all of our organisations and all of our relationships and all of um, the spaces that we move in um, more affirming and inclusive so that it's not just on an individual to to do that work um, so there are a couple of messages that I'd that I'd pass on that's lovely thank you Claire I think they're very important messages so I really appreciate that thanks yeah and I really hear that uh, that theme of respect that's gone through everything that you've you've shared Claire and that respect for people's own choices and their own way of being in the world and I, I really appreciate that message um, so we now have Marie from P flag so welcome Marie um, can you tell us a bit about yourself and about what PFLAG does to support the LGBTIQA plus community? Might just need to unmute there, Marie. Unmute, there we go. There we go. Yes, um, yes, hello everybody. The acronym PFLAG stands for Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. PFLAG is a volunteer community organisation PFLAG started in New York in 1972 when a mother named Jean Manfred walked in a New York Gay Pride March, holding a banner saying, parents of gays unite in support of your, our children. After the march, she was enthusiastically greeted by many young gays and lesbians 
begging her to set up a support group for parents, which she did. Since that time, PFLAG set up a support group for parents. Um, since that time, PFLAG has become an international movement with support, supporters across the globe that arrived in Sydney in 1990. There are chapters all over Australia. Our main aim is to keep families together. PFLAG offers a wonderful opportunity for families, friends and gay people to learn and grow together. We believe it is crucial for families and friends to have accurate, unbiased information regarding gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, intersex and queer issues. You don't have to be gay or have a gay family member to be active in PFLAG. All it takes is preparedness to take a position to make society more accepting and to be a friend to gay people. We provide a range of resources to educate parents and others on homosexuality. We have an information telephone line and an email address. We have a website www.pflagaustralia.org.au. This website has our contact details and those of other PFLAG groups around Australia. Details about our meetings, about events, list of resources and our newsletters. Find us on Facebook under PFLAG Australia and PFLAG Sydney. We hold support meetings. Meetings are open to family, friends and LGBTIQA plus community members. You don't have to join PFLAG to attend. Prior to COVID, we were holding regular meetings at Westmead and in the Inner West. These meetings will restart when it is safe to do so. The dates will be on the website closer to the time. We can also organise meetings on request. Councils are usually happy to provide a space. I have run meetings in Mossman and Manly. We also have PFLAGers in various areas of Sydney who would be happy to meet family members for coffee and a chat. Meetings offer a safe, friendly, supportive setting to share concerns and find comfort and reassurance. Confidentiality is respected. We usually sit in a circle and speak in turn. If parents are attending for the first time, existing members give a reflection of how they were when they first attended and where they are now in their journey. New parents are invited to speak or to remain silent, whatever they wish. We will provide speakers, PFLAG provides speakers to interested organisations such as schools, workplaces, local councils, churches, tertiary institutions, government departments and other support groups. PFLAG welcomes opportunities for education and informed dialogue about sexual orientation and gender identity so as to help create a society that is healthy and respectful of human diversity. We do advocacy. PFLAG fully supports advocacy groups striving to achieve equal rights for our gay sons and daughters. At every opportunity, we seek meetings with local members of parliament and lobby politicians on both sides of the political divide. We are proud to have been involved with the amendment to the New South Wales adoption law to allow same-sex couples to adopt with the passing of the Marriage Equality Bill in 2017. Currently, we are campaigning against the proposed Religious Discrimination Bill. PFLAG advocates for the rights and protection of gay children in schools. We were dismayed when the Safe Schools program was discontinued. We still hear too many stories of members of the rainbow community being poorly treated in schools. As with all students, sexual minority teens are required by law to attend school, even though for them it is continuously dangerous and unsafe. They are too often the constant butt of jokes and taunting because of their being different. The verbal abuse can become intolerable, making it all but impossible to succeed in the classroom. 
when educators present heterosexuality as natural, normal and universal and are silent on homosexuality, they help to create an atmosphere of guilt and isolation and ultimately of fear. Australia ratified the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child in December 1990. This means that Australia has a duty to ensure that all children in Australia enjoy the rights set out in the treaty. We participate in community events like Mardi Gras, we have a stall at Fair Day, we attend Parramatta Pride Picnic and attend Ida Hot Day in the Blue Mountains. Yeah, so that's the answer to the first question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks, Marie. And it sounds like that uh, that educational component and that recognition and, and supporting people in their diversity is a really key part of PFLAG. What issues do you find that friends and family members um, have in supporting loved ones who are a part of the LGBTIQA plus community? Thanks, Mike. Families often don't realise how rare it is for a, for a child to voluntarily disclose that they identify as a member of the LGBTIQA plus community. Many children that do disclose seem a lot happier once they have come out. We have a saying in PFLAG that when the child comes out of the closet, the family jumps in. The child may choose a time to come out that suits them, but not necessarily others in the family. The day after my gay child came out, Jonathan, his sister was sitting her final year physics exam at university. Parents are often surprised by their own negative reactions and feelings toward their own child, particularly if they have previously viewed themselves as accepting of a diversity in others. People identifying as LGBTQIA are often hiding in plain sight. So parents may have little known exposure to this community. Siblings can also struggle. My son has three siblings. His brother is the eldest and then there are two sisters. The younger sister seemed to be still looking glum a couple of weeks after Jonathan came out. I remarked, you still seem upset. You are like Jonathan's second mother, aren't you? Yes, she cried, and I'm such a failure. Parents often struggle when deciding if and when to come out to extended family, friends, acquaintances, acquaintances and work colleagues. Religious and cultural norms. Individuals can find it hard to challenge orthodoxy, particularly in the beginning. Then there is the age of the child. If the child is still young, the parent may think the child is too immature to know. If the child is an adult, the parent can feel that they have been deceived by this child who for so long hid their true orientation. The child's parents could be at different levels of acceptance. This can cause huge tension within and between the parents, which is very troubling for the child. Parents may not be willing to change and adapt to the new reality. Dysfunctional families may wrongly try to make the LGBTQI plus the scapegoat for other family woes. Parents thinking that orientation is a choice and they may want to enroll the child in conversion therapy. They may reject meeting the child's queer friends. If the child is having difficulties with self-acceptance, there may be added complexities of school grades and attendance dropping, showing signs of anxiety and depression. The pre-existing quality of the parent-child relationship. At this time, it is crucial that parents and family members can talk to someone who has experienced similar feelings and has walked the walk. Just being able to articulate how they are feeling would often alleviate a lot of their distress. Also, it's appropriate for parents to have time to adjust to knowing they have a gay child. Few educational opportunities exist for exploring the topic of sexual orientation and parents are often in need of a crash course in sexual orientations upon disclosure by their child. Most of us are the products of a heterosexual society. 
parents bear a heavy burden as a result of the various myths and misconceptions. You can't be free of it just by deciding to. Please get information and, and advice from reliable sources. Thanks, yeah. Mike. Thanks, Marie. You really touched on some of the complexities of the family dynamics and how family members may be impacted and the challenges of responding within the limits of their own understanding. So that education becomes really critical. So if you're going to leave a final message for how loved ones might support um, someone uh, who's identified as LGBTIQA+, what, what might you be able to offer in that domain, Marie? Well, if I can... I've got another question here that I had prepared an answer for about how can friends or family members better support their loved ones during the challenges they may face. Can I go to that one first? Please do. Thank you. My son says that adolescence for him was a lonely time. He was only aware of one other boy who was gay. Since leaving school, he is aware of another four boys from his school who have come out. He says they were probably also surprised to learn that he is gay. He sees that there was a missed opportunity to support one another while they were still at school. As an adolescent, my son was very easy to parent. He seemed content to spend most of his time studying and getting good academic results. He had a nickname, Home Alone. I realise now that many closeted teens are overachievers in their academic and sporting endeavours, with many being given leadership positions as school prefects, etc. My son says that he could have come out to the family as early as 14 and would have done so at 16 if he had seen any evidence that we knew anything about homosexuality. Jonathan knew that he would still be accepted by the family, but wanted to protect us for as long as he could from the effort we would have to put in to catch up. I'm so glad he had that trust in us and it is a lesson that I'm determined that this family will only have to learn once. A lot of thought and preparation usually goes into coming out and the person will have readied themselves for a number of scenarios along worst case to best outcome. They usually interpret as hopeful anything other than worst case scenarios of rejection and being made homeless. Of course, reassuring them that they are still loved as before is hopefully what the parent ends up doing. The importance and value of support in the family, workplace and school should not be underestimated. A loving, supportive family results in a better self-image. However, the experience of families may not have prepared them to play the supportive role. Your child may be able to tell you how they will support be, how they will feel supported by you. Clues will often be in their coming out speech or letter. Clues, clues embedded in my son's coming out speech were, I want our relationship to stay the same. I want you to help make being gay more accepted in the world. I want you to help me tell dad and my brother and sisters. It's okay for the family to admit to being confused. It's okay and very positive to ask for time to do research and to seek support. One of the first people from whom I sought advice was family, friend and GP. His advice was simple. Do not try to change him. I think parent and child both seeking the support of peer gr support groups is a great start. Such groups allow you to attend without coming out or explaining why you were there. You can express your emo emotions without being judged or offending anyone in the family home. There are rules around confidentiality and respect. They, going to a support group allows you to meet people just like yourself helps you and they can help you with tips about the coming out process provide links and referrals to other appropriate services jonathan attended glam a year before coming out to the family it is still running it is a social support group for young people aged 12 to 21 of diverse genders and sexualities 
the group provides educational and social opportunities to support the development of any young person. Jonathan, he was the one who let me know about PFLAG. My first contact was a telephone call which lasted for two hours and then I attended a meeting. Parent and child may make missteps in the process of learning about the new reality. It will take patience and tolerance on both sides. On the night of his coming out, Jonathan asked if I had any questions. I asked him, am I a domineering mother? His answer with a pained expression, no, and I never want to hear you say that again. My next question, are you gay because of the head injury you suffered when you fell at 16? He shook his head. And then a more difficult question, was your fall really an accident? I have four children, Jonathan is the youngest. I love them all equally, but until Jonathan became sure of himself, he did, needed more of my unquestioned support. This became clear early in the piece when I commented that he had started walking with a swivel in his hips and it might be safer for him if he walked normally. He completely broke down in a way I had never seen before. Puzzled, I said, why are you crying? You must have heard worse than that. Yes, he answered, I have heard worse than that. I can take it from everywhere else if I don't hear it from you. You will be a better support if you are mindful of your own mental health. In the days after my son came out, I noticed that I was experiencing a lot of anxiety, poor sleep, poor appetite, a facial tick, rumination. It is important to look after yourself. I got help for my hypervigilance and anxiety. Once you have become more knowledgeable and are able to discuss the topic more freely, you may feel more confident to become an advocate. Here are some suggestions. Model best practice. Encourage your family and friends to become involved. Our three children and their partners are doing their bit to break down the stigma. They come to Mardi Gras and similar events. They are supportive of their friends who come out later in life. They enjoy all the colour in life of being part of the gay community. I remember a fabulous party for John, Jonathan and his partner where the whole extended family made their own clothes out of paper. Say something if you hear a conversation or joke that would make gay people feel uncomfortable. When in the company of others, use language that doesn't assume they are heterosexual. In this way, you are helping to provide a safe space for them. So, Marie, I'm going to just step in there just in the interest of time, but thanks so much for sharing so Thank much you. that you've shared with us tonight and sharing the story of Jonathan, a really powerful um, personal experience of how yeah. you've responded and, and, and that question of his, how can you make it safer to be gay in the world? And here you are tonight on this panel sharing yeah. your experience. So thank Thanks, you so Mike. much. We might get back to you in the Q&A section as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so just a reminder that if you do have a question tonight, then please do post it in the toolbar at the bottom of the screen. Um, you can post that at any time throughout tonight's webinar. Great. So next speaker, we have Hilary from the NS City Legal Service. Hi, Hilary. Thank you for Hi. joining us tonight. Um, I was wondering whether you can give us an overview of your service and what you do to support the LGBTIQA community. Sure. So we are a community legal centre, which means that we are um, we're a, a little bit like legal aid in that we're free, but we're actually an independent organisation. And there are two different sorts of legal centres. There are legal centres that serve a particular area, and there are legal centres that specialise in a particular area of law or client group, and we're unusual because we're both. So we are actually your local legal centre for the Northern Beaches. And we also have a statewide legal service for LGBTIQA people. Um, and the sorts of work that we do, we've done a great deal of work for young trans people, particularly advocating in the family court and also advising um, young trans people about how to, how to uh, start the medical process of transition and also about issues to do with identity documents. Um, just by way of, Small example, um, I recently gave advice to a 
16 year old um, trans boy who um, has unsupported parents who don't want him to start his transition but I was saddened by that but I was proud that we have a service where a young trans boy like that can be calling me from a school bus to get to get advice from a lawyer. Um, so our services are advice, representation and information and also for the last six years we've been coming to 2010 uh, once a month at the Chippendale office um, and now at the Out West service as well. And I think the Chippendale, <laughs> I think the Chippendale service um, is particularly important because as a friend of mine, um, as a friend of mine put it to me, you don't know how to speak up if you haven't had the experience of being heard. And so I think because it's just a freewheeling conversation where we chat about whatever and I very rarely give formal advice. Um, that gives the young people some experience in talking to a lawyer and in finding out more about their rights. That's great. A really essential service by the sounds of it. And it's fantastic that you partner with so many other essential services like 2010. Um, yeah. So I wondered whether you could also touch on for us what issues people tend to face when they do come to your service. So um, the issues are really varied. Um, so on, on one issue that people do present with is discrimination in employment um, and discrimination at school. We run a couple of cases on behalf of young trans people at school, um, including, for instance, one uh, young trans person who wasn't allowed to go to the school formal. And that was at a religious school. And religious schools still currently have an exemption from discrimination law, but we successfully argued that the formal was not part of the school education, so they shouldn't be able to, to rely on that. Um, we, we also have a specialist service for LGBTIQ people who are experiencing domestic violence, and that has operated a safe room at Downing Centre Local Court for uh, the last five years. And the rates of the rates of domestic violence are about the same in the LGBTIQ community as they are in the straight, the straight community, but the forms of domestic violence can be different. So, for instance, using the threat of outing uh, or perhaps um, making uh, transphobic comments. So it's really important for our clients to be able to come to a service like ours and have have uh, support from a service that is not heteronormative as, as Marie mentioned, uh, where they don't have to explain their lives and can just get, get support from people who, um, who understand what's going on. Mm. Obviously, that's really important for you to be inclusive and welcoming and understanding. Um, so I wondered how do people, how do they access your service? Can you tell our audience how they can reach out to you? I've just remembered I completely forgot to say how long we've been, working, we've been going for. Uh, <laughs> we've been operating for 40 years this year. Wow. Uh, we, are, we are in King's Cross. We used to be in Dallyhurst. Um, we're still open at the moment, but most of us are working remotely. Um, our website is www.iclc.org.au and our contact details are there. Um, we also have Facebook and Twitter. Um, at the moment, we're doing the majority of our advice is by phone or by Zoom. Um, we, and we give advice in essentially every area of law other than migration, tenancy and conveyancing. Wow, it's really broad, isn't it? No, that's fantastic. Um, and I'll remind the audience as well that all the details on all of our speakers tonight will go in an email, which will come out to everybody in the next couple of days. Um, so we'll be able to reiterate your service details there, Hilary. Um, Thank you. I wondered whether uh, you could perhaps wrap up um, your presentation with a message of hope. You know, what message would you like to give this community in terms of um, something important to take away from this presentation? I think the message of hope I'd like to give is um, to be conscious of how far we've travelled over the last five, five to ten years even. So now we have marriage equality. Um, and we have fewer barriers for trans young people to get medical treatment. Um, we do have challenges coming up in terms of the religious discrimination bill, which is 
thankfully stuck in Parliament, which is a pleasant side effect of the pandemic. Uh, but I, I think we've made um, we've made so much progress, and I've 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 also noticed in talking to young people in particular that they are so resilient and so confident and expressive about their identity and able to articulate that in much more complex ways increasingly in, increasingly over the last few years. So there's much greater acceptance of trans identities and now of, um, gen, of gender non-binary and gender queer identities than there was, for instance, when I started this job in 2013. That's great. That's really, really good to hear. I think those messages of hope that, that, that change has happened and change is always happening. So thank you so much for that, Hilary. Really appreciate your presentation tonight. Mm. And so that brings us to our final presenter of the evening. It does. So Siobhan from Acon. Welcome, Siobhan. Really nice to have Hi. you with us. Tell us a little bit about Acon and, and what you do. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that I'm working on both Wadigal and, uh, sorry, Wangal and Gadigal land, um, you know, from office to home, back and forth, and uh, acknowledge the traditional owners and pay my respect to their elders. Um, uh, I work for Acon Health. Um, we're a community health organisation and we work uh, only with LGBTI and Q uh, people, um, but also with people who are living with HIV. Um, we started as a volunteer organisation when you know HIV AIDS you know, first arrived in Australia and and had a terrible impact on community, um, and. So that's been our sort of primary remit for a very long time, providing um, HIV support for people living with HIV. Um, so helping them take control of their health um, so that they can look after themselves, um, helping partners, family, friends, um, and also working on HIV prevention. So working with community to reach people who are most vulnerable um, and you know, working on harm reduction and prevention messages, strategies and resources. Mm, really so important. yeah, I mean, there are over 12,000 people in New South Wales who live with HIV um, and that, you know, the, the extraordinary thing about that is that we're talking about people who are living with HIV. Um, so yes, it's a you know lifelong health condition, but it's actually a health condition that can be managed and um, you know does not necessarily mean that people have drastically shortened life uh, span as they did when you know when it was you know when the virus first arrived. Um, so um, over half a million LGBTI people that we know of live in New South Wales. Um, and obviously there might be many more, um, you know, we're not aware of. So we're here to do our best to support those community members um, to have the best health outcomes you know, possible. Um, so that means, you know, physical health, um, sexual health and mental health. Um, we provide a range of services uh, to community members. Um, so, yep, sexual health. So again, coming back to HIV and um, prevention, harm reduction, um, messaging, strategies, resources. Uh, we do um, rapid testing for HIV and and um, other um, sexually transmitted infections. Um, we uh, deliver services uh, in the mental health area. We provide um, alcohol and other drug um, counselling and support. We work on safety and inclusion uh, for people in community and and also in workplaces and. Um, and in and in their homes, 
Um, we work with community around domestic and family violence issues, which other people have referenced um, here tonight. Um, we also work with the ageing communities, so older LGBTI and Q people um, who, you know, are living sort of longer lives, thankfully, um, but who are experiencing issues that uh, present for, you know, everybody, you know, in terms of ageing. Um, so we work with services who provide, um, you know, residential accommodation for ageing people. We do a lot of training, um, sort of cultural diversity training for organisations who offer um, services in a wide sort of, you know, range of, of you know, healthcare. Um, so ranging from GPs to, you know, um, you know, aged care, residential aged care services and, you know, other mainstream mental health and, and alcohol and other drug services. Um, yeah. uh, we provide, you know, specifically counselling for people who are experiencing issues with um, their drug and alcohol use. Um, we provide counselling for people who, you know, around their um, HIV status, so particularly for people who've recently been diagnosed um, as HIV positive. Um, we provide suicide aftercare support, so for people who have might have recently been hospitalised um, and um, or who are struggling, you know, with, um, you know, with suicidal ideation. Um, uh, yeah, um, we have, you know, sort of dedicated services that um, address particular issues um, that uh, affect people, you know, within the communities. Um, so young gay men, Asian gay men, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, older people, as, as I've spoken of, trans and gender diverse people, lesbians and same-sex attracted women. Uh, and so we, we have a, you know, kind of really wide, you know, sort of diverse range of services. Um, we also work, uh, we do a lot of outreach work, you know, throughout New South Wales. So we have offices in Lismore um, and in Newcastle. Uh, and and a sort of and a and a worker at uh, at Port, Mac uh, Port Macquarie, um, and we have an outreach team that basically cover the whole of New South Wales. Um, so you'll find us at you know the Denny Ute muster. You'll find us at Broken Heel. Um, you'll find us you know down south in the Illawarra. Um, you'll you'll find us sort of everywhere. Um, because you'll find LGBTIQ people everywhere. Um, so, you know, we work a lot in those, you know, remote and more regional areas. We partner with, with um, community services a lot. Um, so building their capacity to provide LGBTIQ affirming, you know, and inclusive services. Um, and... Um, and provide, you know, resources, you know, and, and, uh, and, um, and support, you know, to people who are working, you know, sort of outside the capital cities, um, and to community who are, who are, you know, in, you know, regional areas as well. Mm. It sounds like, you know, Ackland's really uh, diversified significantly from that initial need in dealing with HIV. Um, challenges, especially back when you first began, and now you're offering so many different services. What are some of the underlying issues, Siobhan, that you see um, with people who, who do present to ACON looking for help? I mean, I think they're things that people have already referenced. Um, there's the fact that, you know, discrimination, stigma, you know, bigotry, um, you know, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, you know, those things, you know, they still exist. Um, so, you know, those experiences, um, are, you know, obviously going to have a significant impact on people's mental health. Um, and, you know, and 
when your mental health is impacted, your uh, um, you know your physical health is impacted. Um, when your mental health is impacted, you're likely to find you know that sort of seeps into other areas of your life, and you might not be um, performing as well at you know at um, in your studies, at work, um, or you know within your relationships. Um, so, um, I mean, I work specifically on the team leader of our substance support service. Um, so obviously that's, you know, people with issues around their alcohol and, and drug use. Um, so some of those issues might be the same kind of issues that occur, you know, for anyone who might, who might you know, find themselves having problems um, with their substance use. But some of that might also be related to you know, the sort of sexuality and gender diverse issues. Um, uh, you know, social isolation, um, you know, not being able to find help elsewhere. Um, there are also reasons why people might come to us. Um, having poor experiences with other services because of either real or perceived homophobia, biphobia, transphobia. Um, you know, feeling unsafe in other services. Um, you know, these are these are all reasons why people might present to us, you know, for support rather than mainstream services. Um, so, you know, we uh, some people find terrific support from mainstream services, and and I think you know that is improving uh, all the time. Um, but, you know, for other people, it, it's very important that they actually are able to access a, a service where people have, you know, a sort of deeper um, understanding of what might be their lived experience. And it might be a lived experience that's shared by, you know, the worker that, um, that they're sort of collaborating with. Um, or it might be an experience that, you know, that the that the worker, the clinician, is is someone who they might not share that lived experience, but they might be an ally, and therefore, you know, have that um, deeper understanding of of what you know the issues are, you know, for for our clients. Yeah. Thanks, Siobhan. And finally, what message of support or hope might you give someone who may be watching in the audience tonight um, from the LGBTIQA plus community? Um, oh, look, I, I think that, um, you know, I do want to echo, you know, some of the things that Hillary said, you know, that things have changed dramatically um, and, and that is really encouraging. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a well-known phrase, but, you know, that things do get better and that connecting with, you know, community, um, you know, finding your tribe is really, really important. And, and, you know, the way that you do that is to find the organisations possibly that, you know, that offer you the resources and, you know, referral pathways that might be, that might be helpful. Um, and, you know, that there, there is actually, you know, a big tribe of people out here who, you know, they not only want to know you, but they actually want to help you be the best you can be. Um, there's a tribe of people um, you know, everyone who's spoken here tonight who, you know, who are of the opinion that there's absolutely nothing wrong with you um, and that there's a lot, you know, to celebrate and a lot to love about who you are, um, mm -hmm. you know, and also that, you know, you're not just your sexuality, you're not just your gender. Um, you know, there are people who want to know all of you and, and you know, help you sort of be the best that you can be. Um, so, you know, find those people and because we're out here. Yeah, beautiful. And it's one thing that I always love to say that, you know, I want to meet someone as a human first, you know, and I think that we all need that connection and we all need that belonging and that's a really clear message of hope that's come from um, both you and Hillary. So thank you, Siobhan, for that tonight. 
Let's see, we have some questions now. We I do. We've heard from all of our four speakers. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, we just have time for a couple of questions which have come through. Um, first one I'm going to throw to you, Claire. And uh, the question is, what are some of the signs that listeners can look out for to support this community? Um, I think that this uh, question might, might be interesting about um, suicide risk. You know, um, what is it that could put them um, at potential risk in terms of their mental health? Is that about them potentially being alone? Are they involved in sort of risky behaviour, self-harm, etc.? I was just wondering if you could touch on that for us. Thanks, Sue. Yeah, look, I think um, it's a really tricky time. It's important to acknowledge that sometimes when we talk about looking for signs of feeling isolated, that might look a little bit different um, now that we've kind of gone going through this pandemic moment. But, um, you know, I feel like... Um, understanding signals that might be things like a change in somebody's behavior so they might go from being kind of very outward and bubbly to maybe being withdrawn they might use things like language to indicate that they're um, not feeling well or that they're thinking about um, you know thinking that the kind of health isn't feeling that very strong um, I guess you know, it might be around kind of changes to their physical self or it might be not kind of connecting to family and friends in the same way. So, so these are some of the things that someone might be indicating to us that they're seeking um, some support from us and we can see them as invitations. So I think our job is to listen and observe those indications and to acknowledge them um, and to offer space to check in and ask some, ask some tough questions sometimes about how someone's really doing and stick around for the answer. Um, and with the acknowledgement that sometimes um, that means being available to hear someone's story of maybe if they're having thoughts of suicide or, or needing to seek support. Um, it's also important to acknowledge that sometimes it, it's important to refer that, you know, that person to a, another service. And that's what this webinar has been so good at um, making available all of those services. But I do want to acknowledge um, in those questions that have come through a feeling of, um, um, talking about LGBTIQA plus communities, not necessarily talking to LGBTIQA plus communities. And I'd like to say that as someone in the queer community, I know what it feels like to be othered. And that's why we're kind of, I guess, here to do this work tonight is to um, make, make knowledge of those services available, of, of us, of people who do this work because we believe in it and because we want to reach out. So um, I think that's where training, I think that's where these types of community education events are so important. So, um, you know, um, we are queer, I am queer, I am part of this LGBTIQ plus community. I welcome you. I, I hope this has been really useful, but I encourage us all to continue the conversation. Great, great words. Thank you so much, Claire. And I think there, there is strength in reaching out. And, um, and I guess certainly for 2010 and for Northern Beaches Council, that would be registering with us for online training. We're doing online training at the moment for gatekeeper training. Um, but just know more about how to actually have those conversations and what to watch out for. So that's definitely a tip for tonight, I think, for the audience as well. Thanks, Claire. And I think we're actually almost out of time tonight, Sue. So we might have to pause questions there, even though we had a lot of questions coming in. Thank you so much for your questions. I hope that some of our material that is sent out after this webinar will answer some of those questions that you might have. Um, and we hope that's supportive. Yeah. Great. Yeah, well, nice. um, I can't believe that we've come to the end of our, of our hour. I was so enthralled by, um, by all the uh, service summaries and by the stories. Thank you for being so generous with your time uh, to our four speakers. Um, so, yes, we're at the end of our, our fourth webinar now in the series, um, and we hope that this webinar has really provided you with a greater understanding of some of the issues. Um, some of the key stresses affecting mental health and well-being and also providing you tips on how to support, you know, better support yourself and, and supporting others, as well as building that connection to some of the great services um, that we have had with us tonight. Um, so I would encourage people to check out Northern Beach Account Beaches Council's website and perhaps also 2010 in terms of signing up for that gatekeeper training. Um, for our next webinars, I would suggest you go online and register for the next webinar, which 
will be uh, supporting uh, young people and their mental health. So, um, and I would also very strongly encourage you to register for gatekeeper training, which would be fantastic. And really the important message is that suicide first aid skills are really just as important as CPR. Um, to Claire, to Marie, to Hilary and to Siobhan and of course Mike, um, we're extremely grateful for your time and for your insights tonight. Um, huge shout out to my colleagues Liz and Jess who've worked very busily behind the scenes to make the webinars happen. And also the team uh, here at Glen Street Theatre. Um, thanks also to Lifeline Northern Beaches in particular to help us develop the webinars. Um, also acknowledgement to New South Wales Ministry of Health who funded this initiative. So um, thank you so much for logging in. I hope that we've all learned something together tonight. Thank you for your interest and for all your questions. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get to them all. But um, thank you again. Stay safe and take care, everyone. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Bye.